Welcome to the Tuesday edition of the St. Mark's Spark. It is a joy as always to be with you. As we begin this time together, let us have a word of prayer. Almighty God, we give you thanks for the beauty of this day, for the beauty of this earth, for the gift of your creation. Lord, we pray, God, in this time, in this moment, that we might be still, that we might breathe in all that you are, the goodness of the world around us, that we might know that you are near and you are the God who provides. Be with us now, we pray. Amen. It is, again, uh, Saint, it's almost like St. Patrick's Day. I'm getting my winter holidays confused. Uh, it is Groundhog Day. And that question of here we go again, we are right in the middle of winter. This is good news. It means that when winter is here, when the cold is here, and it's going to get cold this week, it means that we are that much closer to spring. We are that much closer to that rebirth and that renewal and that renaissance and frankly, that resurrection to which we hope to celebrate, obviously at Easter, but to which we hope to live into in our own lives. And so uh, it's important, uh, we're just a couple weeks away from the beginning of Lent with Ash Wednesday. Uh, in On this Groundhog Day, it's not so much about whether or not a, a furry rodent sees uh, his sh shadow about Punxsutawney Phil or anything like that. It's far more about re the reminder that we are not alone. Those days where it's sunny, those days where it's cloudy, the reminder, we are not alone. And so I'm going to read our scripture reading today. It's not a, a long passage, but I think it's an important one for us to hear for a number of reasons. It's from Mark chapter 8, verses 1 through 10. Listen now as God speaks to us through God's word. In those days when there was again a great crowd without anything to eat, Jesus called his disciples and Jesus said to them, I have compassion for the crowd because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on their way. And some of them have come from such a great distance. His disciples replied, how can one feed these people with the bread when we're out here in the desert? Jesus asked them, well, how many loaves do you have? And they said, seven. Then Jesus ordered the crowd to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves. And after giving thanks, he broke them and gave them to the disciples to distribute. And they distributed them to the crowd. They had also a few small fish. And after blessing them, he ordered that these two should be distributed. They ate and they were filled. And they took up the bro broken pieces left over, seven baskets full. Now there were about 4,000 people, and he sent them away. And immediately he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the district of Dalmatha. May this God's word speak to our hearts, our minds, our spirits. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now you hear the story and you might say, well, that's not how it goes. I know the story. Isn't there a, a boy? Isn't there a boy and, and we know the, the, five, the loaves and the fishes that he offers up and Jesus does that. And, and it's about Jesus feeding 5,000 people. So in today's story, we have seven loaves are mentioned. And we're told that Jesus feeds 4,000 people. It's right there in the scriptures for us to, to see, but sometimes we gloss over, we, we miss something that's right in front of our faces. There are two feeding stories in the Gospels. There are two feeding narratives of large crowds. The first time that Jesus does that, it's when he's in his own country with his own people, with the Jewish uh, folks who are around him that are following. And we're told there that there was a, a boy who gave what he had and that was enough because it got the food was taken and it was blessed and it was passed out and it was multiplied and they were told about the 12 basketfuls that were picked up well today's passage we hear about it seems like the exact same story but it's jesus is not with his people in fact jesus is on the other side and hearing the good news on the other side these were not the good jewish people 
that were following Jesus. These were the outsiders. These were the Gentiles. These were the ones that those on the inside saw as ne'er-do-wells. They saw as outside of the covenant, outside of the plan, outside of God's love. This is the story. In looking at these two compared to one another, we see a truth about Jesus. Jesus never gathered moss. He never was in one place too long. And we're told that in all of Jesus traveling, there was so much of that work that was done in, in Israel, but a lot of that work was done across the border. A lot of that work was done with what people would call refer to as foreigners. We, we hear the story of the Syrophoenician woman. We hear the story of the Samaritan woman. We hear these stories of, of the Roman guard and, or the Roman officer. We hear these different things. And while we might be inclined to be tribal, while we might be inclined to think that God is as particular as we are in the way we view the world, that God is as provincial as we are, we have a God who not only created the world, but a God who loved the world, who loved the folks on this side and the folks on that, a God who loves us all. This group was faithful following Jesus. This group of outsiders wanted to be on the inside with Jesus. They wanted to learn. They wanted to be healed. They wanted to grow. They wanted to grasp the kingdom of God that was among them. And so they followed. And in the middle of the wilderness, without any kind of food to eat, where, where stomachs are growling, where people are tired, they don't even necessarily have the strength to make it home, Jesus provided again. In the first story, we're, we're told about the, the loaves and the fishes. In this story, we're, we're told about the seven loaves of bread and a couple small fish. There is a Eucharistic moment that is going on here about Jesus taking the bread, blessing it, giving it to his disciples, and then they distributed it. We're all hungry right now. It might not be for food, but we're all in some kind of wilderness with this pandemic, with isolation, with, with any number of things that might be happening health-wise, whatever's going on in your life, whatever dry place, whatever barren place that you are experiencing, Jesus can still meet us there. It doesn't matter if we're on the inside. It doesn't matter if we're on the outside. All it takes is for us to acknowledge that we are hungry, to admit that we are thirsty, to say to God, I need you. I can't do this on my own. I can't make it home on my own. I need you near. And I need you here. The good news is that Jesus fed the people who were on the inside. And Jesus fed those who were on the outside. In both of these stories, there are basketfuls of abundance that are left over. I invite you to pay attention to the deepest hunger inside you right now. I invite you to take, pay attention to your tears even because in them there is a truth that is springing forth. I invite you to listen to your life, to recognize where you need to be fed to recognize where you need to be watered, to recognize where you need to go, perhaps in the middle, and we are in the middle as much as we can of winter right now. This is the most appropriate time to do this examination and to ask those questions, to do that soul searching, and at last to cry out to God, the one who has come, the one who saves, is the one who feeds. I pray God's blessing on you this day. I pray uh, as we have uh, six more weeks of winter to know that God is with us at all times. And we trust that the day is getting longer, even if it is cold. May God be with you all.